So today we pause in hope. We pause in hope. We have two scripture texts today. We're not, we're not using the gospel lesson from Luke today. Instead, we're using the Old Testament as well as a, a reading from uh, Paul. Why? Because they both speak to hope. The first is from Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. This is a reminder that hope can come out of something that we believe might not even be there anymore. It might be a stump, something that's dead. A shoot shall come, out of, shall come from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. So this is the prophet foretelling the coming of Jesus, foretelling the coming of Jesus in a situation that may have appeared hopeless, a stump. But instead, he is the shoot that comes out of the stump. And then these words from Paul. He says, therefore, since we're justified by, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Not only that, but we also boast in our suffering, suffering and hope, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So we can live in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, at the garden here, we are blessed with a variety of different people, with a variety of different faith backgrounds. I am always so amazed when I learn about the people in this community. We have people here who practice and participate in yoga on a regular basis. Someone told me not long ago that yoga actually means yoke. And Jesus talks about a yoke, a yoke being easy. His yoke is, being, is easy. Then and the other people here identify themselves as spiritual, not religious. And they probably have been a little more influenced by Zen, which is kind of interesting to me because there's a Zen quality to Jesus as well. Jesus calls us away from the busyness of life on a regular basis. He himself moves from the busyness of life on a regular basis. Then finally, there are others here who on a Sunday or any day will read the Bible. But do you know they'll also take time to read the writings of Buddha, or the writings of the Dalai Lama. Well, for me, I think it's important to remember that the living word of God lives in our ability to live it. Jesus quoted the prophets all the time. Jesus used parables to try to teach us about our faith. I believe these other writers do just the same. And I believe here at the garden, we have found a way to bring Jesus and the practices and the love of Jesus hopefully away from religion and more towards the heart of what he meant, and that is sharing the love and his light and his love with everyone. As I stated earlier, Advent is a season of anticipation and waiting, waiting for new life, um, yet we have to be mindful that waiting is not stopping or it's stagnant or boring. This waiting calls us to be attentive and actually to wait in this space in between the kumbaka, as Carol put it. For me, Advent is like the new way of waiting at amusement parks. Now, when I was a kid and you went to Disney, you waited, right, in stanchions. And it was a horrible, awful experience. You could wait there for hours for a 90-minute space mountain ride. But if you've been to amusement park lately, like um, Universal Studios in Harry Potter land, which I love, you wait in line for the Forbidden Journey, and it's very interesting because they've done something very different. They've created different things to engage you in the story of what you'll soon be experiencing. It's so great that you get to be reminded of all the books you've read and all the stories and there are characters that even speak to you. In fact, the last time we were there, I had to like encourage the people to keep the line moving. Have you ever had that happen when you were a kid? Never. But that, for me, is what Advent's about. Advent is about not only preparing for the coming of Christmas, but experiencing the story on a daily basis as I wait and finding a way to live in the power that is Jesus. 
So today we pause in hope. We pause in hope. But what is hope exactly? I asked folks who attended the Advent study the other night what hope was to them, and it was interesting to me some of the answers I got. I got, of course, hope is a feeling or an expectation that something's going to happen. Another person said, hope is the realization that today was a bad day, but tomorrow is going to be better. We have some folks in the class that are going through life transitions, some people retiring, some people considering going back to school. And for them, hope is that feeling when you're closing one door and you have your hand on the next door and you're just trying to peek in to see what's coming next. One of my favorite ones was Pam who said, you know, for me, hope shows up and has been showing up with all the uh, lights on houses. She said, look at all the people who are so busy in their daily life. They've got kids, they've got jobs, they have more than enough to do, but they have taken the time to put lights on their home. For her, that is what hope looks like. Hope looks like that the love and the light of the season is greater than the busyness that of things I have to do, I want the world to know that there is a light that can overcome the darkness and I'm going to cover my house with that light. I love that image. In fact, since Wednesday, I have not been able to look at any of these houses with lights on them without thinking of the word hope. I don't even know about you, but I need a little hope right now. I need a little Hope, particularly after this last week, I mean, it's been a tough week. Our government's all fighting about taxes, taxes that have real impact on a lot of people. Our workplaces are not necessarily safe anymore. People are harping, harming one another. Matt Lauer now. I don't want to talk about it. I'm grieving. We are waiting. We are waiting here. We are waiting for tax reform. We are waiting for the workplace to be safe again. We are waiting to see who is going to be next after Matt Lauer. I'll tell you what, when I finish watching the news on a regular basis, I'm feeling cynical and I'm feeling critical. I can feel hopeless. You are too, aren't you? Yeah. I can feel hopeless. I would say this year that we need the hope of Christmas more than ever. Because there is some true hopelessness in this world. You know, Emily Dickinson once said, When hope dies, life is like a broken winged bird that cannot fly. When hope dies, we become cynical, we become critical about life, and we, like that bird, cannot fly. And guess what? You were made to fly. God made you to fly. Hopelessness gets in the way. So today we're going to talk about if we can rebirth, if God can rebirth hope in our lives in this season. Hope is fundamentally an attitude we choose to take about the future. Hope is not based on how well things are going now. Hope is the attitude we choose to take about the future. Now, I'm one of these people who I am all about you know, if you believe it, you can see it. If you know it, you can achieve it. If you can make it happen, you know, God's got your back. And if it's a good thing, God's with you. I'm all about that. But do you know what? The same is true for our feelings about good things and not so good things. Now, on one hand, we have this thing that I just talked about called hopelessness. The world is at times feeling hopelessness. Something tells me if I choose to look for the hopelessness in the next four weeks, I will find hopelessness in the next four weeks. But then on the other hand, if I believe that there is hope for the future, I suddenly realize that there is more hope than hopelessness. I suddenly realize that God is working in this world in ways through hope that I never realized before. So this season, let me tell you, since we started with a prophet, you too can be a prophet. We have self-fulfilling prophecies here we can participate in. Hopelessness or hope. You choose. But remember, Jesus came into the world to give us hope. That so no matter what, no matter how bad things may be, there is always hope 
for a better future. Sometimes we hear people say, you know, I don't want to give someone false hope. False hope. That doesn't even exist. There's no such thing as false hope. False hope doesn't even exist. There is either hope or hopelessness. People around us need to experience us in hope, not hopelessness. Again, the choice is up to us. You see, there is a life-giving power in hope itself. In fact, science shows that hope can help impact someone's health and well-being. Hope, scientifically, can transform your life. Now, you're all aware of these double-blind studies, right? These, uh, these double-blind studies where uh, they work to try to help with clinical trials or with medicines and things like that. And in a double-blind study, you have some people who actually get the medicine, and then other people get this thing called a placebo or a sugar tablet that is not the medicine. So say, for example, there's some pharmaceutical company doing this, and 200 people are suffering some, from some particular disease. So they take 100 people and they give them the medicine, and they take the other 100 people, give them the placebo. Inevitably, when you look at these tests, it doesn't matter if the person had the medicine or not. Not all of them, because medicines work, and I'm all for better living through chemistry myself. But um, there are some, some people that improve who are on the placebo. And time and time again, science shows that it's all about attitude. All about attitude. All about attitude. 10 to 15% sometimes in some of these studies are able to improve their health totally based on attitude. Lynn McTarget has written a book called The Intention Experience. She talks about 4,600 heart patients who were involved in a study to take this new heart medication. Half of the patients received the new heart medication and half received the placebo. Doctors gave them all the instructions which they needed to take these pills three times a day. Those who took the drug three times a day did equally well, whether they were actually taking the medicine or the sugar pill. See, this show, study shows that these people being consistent about their lives and believing that all things are possible helped improve them more so than the pills. Don't you love those ads on the TV for uh, medications? You know, oh, if you do this, you could get hurt, or you do this, and you could die. Take this medicine, it'll help you stop itching, but you may die! I wish they would end that with, but actually hope would probably work a lot better too. Add a little hope into this medication and it might just make a difference for you. I want you to do that next time you hear one of those ads. And hope at the end. Make sure you say that. See, I believe that we, God has given us this thing called free, free will. And we have the ability to step into it, hopefully. We have the ability to live in hope and to per and participate in self-fulfilling prophecies. And I'm going to say hopefulness. We have had a rough few weeks here at the Garden. There are many people in our community that are either struggling themselves with cancer, have family members who are struggling with cancer for a long period of time, and the diagnoses are tough and hard to take. But remember what Paul said, that suffering builds endurance, and endurance builds character, and character helps us move into hope, and hope will not disappoint. Time and time again, I have been with people who are in terrible situations, and the hope that shines from them is a lesson to all of us about how God heals. Sometimes that healing and that hope is in this life. Sometimes that hope and healing is in the life to come. But they live in such a way with hope that they can make it through some terrible, hard, tough situations. There is no such thing as false hope, my friends. There is only hope.
And hope is a choice. And hope can influence your life and the lives of those around you. As you meet with your family members in the weeks to come, may you pause in hope, particularly with those who are struggling with health or issues. Just pause. Breathe in hope. And seek for God to bring hope into those situations. You know, Emily Dickinson once said this about hope. She talked about hope dying, but she also talked about the power of hope. She said, hope is something with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a song without the words and never stops at all. My prayer to you is in this season of Advent, we will find a way to live in hope. We will pause in hope. We will breathe in hope. We will exhale hope. And indeed, we will sing the song of hope without words. We will be mindful as one door closes, the next door can open with great hope and possibility. We can remember every time we see the lights on someone's home that not only are they there to light the house, but they're there to light our hearts so that we may shine this thing called hope for all the world to see. Amen.